I'm glad you're here. The Lord has an appointment with you this morning. And please stay tuned as we share the word with you, both uh, in the scripture and the, the word alive in our lives. And it's a testimony that will be shared this morning that's going to help you in your growth and it's going to help you in your journey with Jesus. Amen. Let's go to prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for the audience. Thank you for your church. Thank you for our guests, especially our guest speaker this morning. Father, I just thank you for all the love that you give us, all the things that we can count and those that are beyond our counting. Thank you for the love and the mercy and thank you especially for your word. We love your word and we want to apply your word in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray and God's people said, amen. Okay, you believe we started in the book of John, the first Sunday of this year, and we finish in the book of John, close to the last Sunday of this year. Imagine that. Let's go to John chapter 21. As we had the finish line of the book of John, we're going to find in this gospel, a very special conversation between two good friends. Two good friends that had worked together, one being the mentor, the rabbi, and the other one being the disciple. And before we get into the scripture itself in chapter 21, I'm just going to do a little background check of the history a little bit of the apostle Peter. Some of us have conditions of the personality of Peter. I recognize that myself. Uh, you guys know me for, a, for many years, most of you, and you know that I like to plan things, but I'm also impulsive. Sometimes when the, the Lord tells me something, I stop and I do it. And uh, that's me. Uh, I learned that from my, uh, my pastor, um, uh, Pastor the family is here, uh, one of my pastors, a wonderful man of God that loved me and, and mentored me uh, at the beginning of my journey with Jesus, Eric De Cesare. He was a man that loved, a, he's a man that loves to hug. And he hugs, man, he can really squeeze you so tight that you can feel it in your bones. Um, and just a lot of love. And so today we're going to talk about relationships and how important they are. And especially, we, I titled this, Reconciliation Requires Forgiveness. Something went wrong between the friendship of Jesus and Peter. Not so much of Jesus towards Peter, because Jesus knew already was about to happen. But it was more like the friendship of Peter towards, towards Jesus. And can we blame him for that? And the answer is no, if we get into all the details. Um, Peter has three seasons in the Bible that we need to understand. The first one was the discipleship. From the moment his brother Andrew said, hey, come meet this guy, he's the Messiah. Peter took on and ran with him, and, uh, and Jesus talked to him. He, he said just a simple thing, follow me. And he dropped the net, and he dropped his profession, and the fishing gear, and followed Jesus immediately. He didn't think about it. He didn't plan about it. He didn't say, I'm going to pray about it. He just followed Jesus. That was Peter. Thank goodness for that moment, being impulsive and saying, I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm not going to wear around. I'm going to follow Jesus. And then you find that time of mentorship, about three years and a half with Jesus. Then you find Peter in the book of Acts in leadership role. He is the leader at that moment. And then you're going to find later on, right before his death in Rome to Nero, you're going to find Peter, a very mature man, and he sends us two letters, First Peter and Second Peter, and tells us a deep understanding of his convictions 
and the uh, and the scriptures anointed by the Holy Spirit, he brings us this story. So, looking at Peter, we all have that moment of passion. He was very passionate about Jesus. He loved Jesus with all his heart. So, we're going to find those three seasons about Peter. And so, today I'm going to go over a few things of what Peter did. I'm just going to remember off the top of my head because I want I'm pressure with time. But Peter was the type of guy that whatever Jesus did, he wanted to do. Remember the storm? And then Jesus started walking towards the ship, towards the boat. Who wanted to be out? Peter. And he said, instead of saying, Jesus, come over to the boat. He said, can I go there, Jesus? I'm paraphrasing, right? And Jesus said, come. He gets off the boat and starts walking in water. And then he sees the water and the breeze and the wind. He gets scared. And then he starts sinking. And Jesus pulled him over. And Jesus told him, hey, man of little faith. <laughs> and then you find him saying things like when Jesus went to the mount and then had a, a special meeting with Moses and Elijah and Peter. Let's make three tabernacles. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. That was Peter. Right? And then what you find, Jesus said, Ask a question. He said, who do men say I am? Oh, some say that you are John the Baptist. Some say that you are Elijah. Some say that you are Jeremiah. He said, okay, fine. Who do you guys think I am? Everybody was quiet. And then again, Peter. Peter, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You are the anointed one. And Jesus appraised his word. You've done well, Peter. Jonah, Bar Jonah, the son of Jonah. Peter, and for those words, I should build my church. And the kingdom of, and, and the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. Again, Peter. Um, but then something happens to Peter. After Jesus dies, buried and resurrected, Jesus is confronted with a lot of things. But when he, they arrested Jesus, we saw that in the past. We talked about it already, right? When they arrested Jesus, there was Peter. Struggling. With his faith. He followed Jesus from far away. And they caught him. There was a young lady that saw. She was a servant of Caiaphas. The high priest. And she saw Peter. Said, ah, you're one of them. He's like, no I'm not. He gets away from her for a while. And then she goes, yes you are. You speak like one of those Galileans. And then another man comes and sees Peter and says, yep, I confirmed that. In fact, I saw him. And Peter denies. And the word of God says in Matthew that he actually cursed and cussed. So Peter, after three years and a half of discipleship, a crisis come, and Peter is back to his old Peter. It happens to all of us. We need to be careful. When everything's good, we're good, right? We're Christians, we, we raise our hands and stuff. But when you have a crisis, then you begin to, oh, is God with me? Am I good enough for God? Just imagine all the questions Peter had. So now let's go into the word. And, 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 and I want to go quickly because I want to bring this special testimony. Chapter 21, verse 15 on. Very special. Do you have it? Okay, good deal. Give me one sec. Remember that Peter saw Jesus not only cooking 
but also being the waiter to the seven disciples that showed up at the beach. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? When you go to the Greek, you, want, you find the word agape. Agape means that special bonding, that love that suffers all, that love that endures all, that love that believes all. That is agape, unconditional. And then he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Peter responds with another Greek word for love. This time it's not agape. It's phileo, meaning I love you as my best friend. Peter didn't want to use agape. He didn't feel qualified to use agape. He used phileo, meaning that. He said to him, feed my lamb. Jesus started by telling Peter, take care of the little ones. He was going to be the leader. He said to him a second time. Jesus loves to say and ask things more than twice, right? Verily, verily, I say unto you. I love when he starts that. He's going to just give you the most beautiful revelation after he said that, right? He said to him again, a second time, Simon, son of Jonah. Again, he calls him by first name and by last name. Son of Jonah, do you love me? Do you agape me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He was beginning to answer and said, okay, where is he heading? Now, he is with the rest of the disciples, but he's talking one-on-one -on -one in a very special way with Peter. He said to him, Tend my sheep. You might think, okay, second time is enough, right? How many times Peter denied Jesus? Three times. I mentioned to you about the importance of number three when it comes to Bible uh, understanding. He said to him a third time, you see, Jewish people, when they speak to their children and they want something done, traditionally at the table, they speak the same thing three times. If your teenager is not understanding something, explain to him three times. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved. Of course he was. But this time Jesus didn't say, do you agape me? Jesus went down to the level of Peter. Do you phileo me? Peter could not come up to the level of Jesus, so Jesus went down to his level. So can they have an understanding between the two of them? Isn't that beautiful, the love of Jesus, when he wants to restore you, when he wants to reconcile you? Amen? He said, do you love me? Do you feel love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. Do you know that I love you? Peter responded this time about Jesus knowing everything. So Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Most assuredly I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wish. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. Jesus begins to prophesy the ministry of Peter. This he spoke signifying by the death he will glorify God. And we had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. How the whole ministry started with Peter and Jesus by the Sea of Galilee. What Jesus said to Peter and Andrew, follow me. 
house is close in this. This time, follow me. Jesus went to the cross. He's telling Peter now, follow me. Eventually, Peter went to the cross. Tradition has it that he didn't want to be crucified like Jesus. He asked to be crucified upside down. Every relationship that I know is proven by a discrepancy. It happens to the best of relationships. I've been married 48 years, and we never had a fight with my wife. Till Jesus was not able to be so. Amen. It happens. It's human nature. We're individual. We have free will. Sometimes it happens by perceptions. Sometimes it happens by words. Sometimes it happens by acts. We fail somebody or someone is going to fail us. That's a given. And sometimes when that happens, and I see this more in Christianity than even in the world. I'm sorry to say this, but it's a fact. When people get upset with one another, they, they, don't, they don't like you anymore. They, they just... This past Sunday, my dear sister came up and gave a testimony. And she said, you know, I love the fact that our pastor makes some decisions. He loves to make decisions that are very special when he hears the Lord. And he may sound crazy, but he's crazy for the Lord. So we were having dinner yesterday with, with the worship team. She came up to me and said, Pastor, sorry I, I said you're crazy. I said, hey, sister, don't worry. I'm going to go to Second Baptist next Sunday. <laughs> That's the mentality of many Christians. They're in a, in a crystal that is made of, of, of just glass, and they break away easily. No. You need to learn how to relate, and you need to know how to forgive. Jesus felt the pain. Of Peter denying him. He knew it ahead of time. His best friend denying. Saying no I don't know this man. I don't know what you're talking about. And then he started cussing and cursing. He went back to the fisherman style of speaking. He went back to the old Peter. And yet Jesus. Could have this conversation. With Peter. Peter, one more minute, I'm done, I promise. He said, Peter, I, want, I need to talk to you, Peter, in private. You know how you honor in public and in private you rebuke? You know, Peter, what you did was bad. You denied me three times. And I warned you, didn't I? And you denied me three times. You're not fit for ministry. Maybe take a, a year off before you go back and do something for me. That sounds like a church, doesn't it? it doesn't it? Right? You're not, you need to sit and take a break. This is not, you're not good enough. You, you felt me bad. In the country, Jesus loves on him and he asked, Do you agape me? Do you agape me? And, and Peter was not getting it yet until Jesus said, do you feel help me? Peter, Lord, you know everything. And he started crying. Because he failed the Lord. And yet the Lord tells him, you're going to follow me. Restores him. He rescues him. Forgiveness, forgiveness is essential in life. There's one verse, and I promise I'm done. There's one verse, Matthew, in Matthew, that you need to remember all your life. I remember this verse. This is in the Lord's Prayer, and right after the Lord's Prayer, it says this. But if you don't forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And forgiveness is like jail. Unforgiveness, 
destroys your life. It makes you bitter. In fact, not only physically, I'm sorry, emotionally, spiritually, emotionally, and also physically. Doctors tell you that a lot of diseases come from the, from the soul, from things that you do with your mind that are not right. So this morning, I'm going to bring a good friend of mine, a family that I love and cherish. This family knows me when I was in diapers in the spirit, at the spirit level. They love on me. I started going to a church on the rock, Iglesia La Roca, in Sugarland, many years ago. Close, close to 40, possibly? Yeah, close to 40. And when I walk into that church, something happened to me. I met the presence of the Holy Spirit, and my life changed forever. I was a banker. I was a very narcissist person. I loved me first, I loved me second, and I loved me third. I started going to the church. And I was baptized by the Holy Spirit. And this family loved me and took care of me on my first steps as a baby. I would not be in this pulpit preaching the gospel without the love that that family gave to me. And one of them is coming this morning. Uh, Kennedy Cesare has a testimony to share with us. Um, please welcome him. His, uh, and also I want to welcome his mom is with, with us, his daughter. And also his precious wife. I, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't do the, the order wrong. But anyways, he for, you're forgiving me, right? When a man was with three women, they're special to him. He's a, he's a good man. In my book, he's a good man. Kenneth is a wonderful man. He loves his pastor. And uh, his pastor was with him when his dad, daddy passed away. Good man. He was a wonderful pastor. And he allowed us to borrow him today um, to bring a testimony that's going to bless you. So let's welcome Kennedy Cesare. Oh, you need this mic? Thank you, Pastor George. What a blessing and honor to be with you guys today. And my pastor that... Um, Pastor Jorge mentioned, he sends his love to both of you. Um, Pastor Danilo Montero, we assist Lakewood Spanish, my wife and I, my, my two daughters. Uh, one of them couldn't make it. She's at home studying for midterms <laughs> this week before Christmas break. But um, Pastor Danilo, um, manda un saludo de, de su parte y, y Pastora Gloriana. Um, this is a really special moment for me. I'm going to try to be pithy as they say, which means short, but I try, because <laughs> I tend to, when I, when I speak, actually, so you'll know, Pastor Jorge, thank you, I'm honored and blessed to be here to share with your congregation, this is the first time I share from a pulpit this testimony, so I feel super honored, I've shared it in my life, obviously, but friends and people I meet and things like that, but I got to say, my dad that passed away a month ago, and if I get a little emotional and teary, forgive me. It's still, you know, it's pretty recent, obviously. So um, my dad, um, an amazing man, he shared this testimony on the streets wherever he went. The, uh, the last, uh, he was in the restaurant business many years, um, Gabriel. And he, I, I was counting the other day, he had opened like 14 restaurants, Pastor Jorge, in, in the course of his career. Uh, some of them were at the same time that ran, you know, simultaneously and sometimes no so he he was he was in, he was a, a fighter he never quit but my dad the last thing he did in his career wise work wise was to drive a truck when he got out of the restaurant business and he would um a, a flatbed and he would take you know loads to different parts of the country and wherever he would go on the streets um, he would always come back from his trips right mom and he would have stories about um how god used it's really our testimony. It's my mom, my dad, and mine. It's, it's a family testimony. 
and how many people it had impacted in their lives. So let me tell you what happened. But before I, before I tell you, I just, if, I, if I could just do this one little thing, I want to read the scriptures. You don't have to look it up. It's okay. Psalms 91, you're probably very familiar. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. Sorry. The song you guys just sang, I just had a picture of it again in my mind. Thank you, Pastor. I can only imagine when, you, when we did that song, worship team, you're, you guys are awesome, by the way. I love the, whoever was on bass. Who's on bass? I play bass. You're awesome. <laughs> I'm a bass player. Um, I thought of my dad. I'm sorry. I just had a flashback of that song. I don't know why. Um, I can only imagine. He's there right now enjoying that. My dad. He's there. He's our refuge. So I just had a picture of the refuge that my dad is in right now, which is the place we all want to be. I, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I will trust. Surely he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and your buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night. How many of us know all the things in the news and stuff, pestilences, Things that happen, COVID, all that stuff. There's so much stuff around us to make us fear. But when we abide in the shadow of the Almighty, we don't have to worry about those things. And here's the key for me and my testimony, and I'll get into it now. Nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. My testimony that we're referring to, because there's a lot of things that's happened in my life, not just what I'm going to share. I could be here for like a long time, but I'm going to keep it. I said I was going to keep it short. Forgiveness. What does forgiveness have to do with anything I'm talking about? It saved my life. Forgiveness saved my life. What do I mean by that? Rewind. Around the time that you joined La Roca Sugarland, I was 18, 19. I was 19 years old. I was 18 when you joined, so I had my ex I had an accident, a car accident, when I was 19. Early June, I, was, I surfed. I grew up surfing my whole life. I've slowed down a little bit now because I've just been too busy. I was on my way to the beach to go to Surfside. I had a little pickup truck, a Suzu pickup. I had two of my boards in the back. <coughs> Pardon me. And I'm headed down to Surfside, and I'm going through a road where it's, it's just two lanes, and 18 wheelers headed in my direction. And it's a it's a indique. It's at the top of a, a, a dike, so there's nowhere to go. Twenty feet down on the right, twenty on the left. You're up on top, right? And there's an eighteen wheeler coming towards me. And he, as I go into the turn, he lost control, and I had nowhere to go. As either I pick going down the dip, down to the bottom of that thing, or I don't know. So I did what I thought was right. I kind of tried to swerve him, but he hit me almost head on. If you were to see pictures of that truck, I sent you those pictures, George. Um, it's like somebody got a can opener and just, oh, I didn't know they were there. Awesome. It, it destroyed my vehicle, all the windows. All the windows were shattered. The back bumper was practically almost wrapped halfway to the front on the left. Um, I remember the glass shattering. <laughs> Like vividly, I remember just a cloud of glass. Literally. I was really fit at the time because I've been, you know, young and I surfed all the time. So I, I remember holding on to the, the steering wheel and thinking, this is going to be tough. I remember that. And I flipped a few times. I wouldn't have said that I, I rolled down the, down the side of that hill three or four times. And I landed at the bottom of the, uh, on the driver's side, like this. So I came to, well, I didn't pass out, but when, when the truck stopped moving, the visors were down, the little mirror, and I saw my face just covered in blood, 
and I started panicking, and I got so, long story short, I pull myself out of the truck somehow, throw myself on the grass, somebody comes running towards me, and they get close to me, and they say, oh my God, and they laughed, <laughs> so much help that, that person was, maybe they were going to call an ambulance, I don't know, but all I can tell you is I laid in the grass, everything's sparkling, and I'm looking up, and I'm thinking, God, if this is my time to go home, I'm ready. Because I, I got saved when I was five. I grew up in a Christian home. Eric led me to the Lord. I had a dream that I was, my, bro, my old, old, oldest brother, I had a dream that I was burning in hell. I was crying. I was six. He came into, that, into the bedroom. He goes, what's going on? I told him the dream. He said, you need Jesus. <laughs> he was already preaching. He was like eight years old. He goes, you had that dream because you don't have the Lord in your heart. If you have the Lord in your heart, you're not going to go to hell. And he led me to the Lord. And I was six. Eric, my oldest brother, led me to the Lord. And you know, okay, let me get back to the testimony. So I knew that I was going to be okay. I knew that I, if I died on the grass that day, that I was going to be okay. But I also told the Lord, Lord, I feel like there's a purpose for my life. But if you want to take me, I'm ready. So I'm laying there. To make that long story short, they got me. Ambulance took me to the hospital. I had tons of glass in my eyes. Uh, I had cuts everywhere. I had fractures in my pelvic bone. Two fractures on my pelvic bone right here. Fractured left leg. Um, the worst of it was that whenever you fracture a bone, um, you, um, in many cases, you, your bone marrow comes out if it's a bad fracture. And your body either absorbs it or it doesn't affect your your, life, your your body. In my case, it became a syndrome. It went through my bloodstream and it landed in my lungs. It's called acute pulmonary syndrome. And what happens is like um, your coagulo de grasa. It's like a, it's like bone, it's bone marrow. And that is a syndrome that's very difficult to clear from your lungs. It starts infiltrating your lungs, filling your lungs with fluid. And it's a type of pneumonia. So three days later, they had to respirate me. That's the last thing I remember. Everything is fuzzy. All of it's fuzzy. I was in and out, but that I remember because it hurt. They respirated me. And then they gave me something to help me go out. That's the last thing I remember before, before God did what he did. So where does my dad come into this picture? What, where, where's for, forgiveness come into this? Okay, so all along, the family knows what's going on. My brother, Dennis, the middle brother, he's calling KSBJ, told KSBJ. They were praying on the radio. We have a lot of family that, in ministry. I have uncles that are pastors. Pastor Loreto, he was, you know, all, uh, a lot of people knew, you know, what was going on with me. So a lot of people were praying. Um, one particular pastor from our church, Abraham Moyano, he was an evangelist for our church in La Roca in those days. He found out, obviously, about the accident. He was preaching somewhere overseas. When he found out, he, he, he committed to praying and fasting about me because he knew he was going to see me, and God spoke to him that God was going to heal me. And so he prayed and fasted for a few days before he got back to Houston. When he got to Houston, he went straight to the hospital, and this is around the time where they respirated me. He got into town that same day. He went straight to the hospital, my mom, my dad, my brother Eric, who was Pastor La Roca, uh, Sugar Land in those days. Pastor Carlos, my dear first cousin, Loreto's son, and Loreto. They were all at the hospital. They went into the room, the family room, you know, where they give you to, to be. I was in ICU. So that day, before Abraham got there, the doctor had told my parents, they had done what they could do. They didn't, this syndrome was something that there was no cure for it. That that evening, that night, 80% chance I wouldn't make it through the night. So there was nothing. One of the doctors, the internal medicine doctor, wanted to, for some reason, I found out, obviously I found out all, out all this stuff later, right? But he wanted to open me up and do something, right? Me quería operar un doctor. And my mom said, no, oh no, my, the head doctor said, Dr. Slade, no, over my dead body. You're not going to open Kenneth up. There's no need for that. There was a battle going on with that. Finally, that was yeah, not going to happen. 
Anyway, Abraham gets there. He gets the news. They get into the room to pray before they come and see me to pray for my healing. I'm out. All right? I'm out. I'm unconscious. And <clears throat> so they get in the room. They start praying. It was around 10, 11 in the evening, so I'm told. Um, and they start praying. Ten minutes into the prayer, they're just praying, worshiping and praying. Pastor Abraham Moyano, so the evangelist, has become, he'd been fasting for three days. He stops the prayer. He stops the prayer and he looks to my dad, Gabriel. He says, Gabriel, ¿vo has perdonado a ese hombre? Have you forgiven that man? That, that wrecked me. That 18 year old driver. And my dad lost it. He completely lost it. No, never. I will never forgive that man. He killed my son. He's killing my son. I will never, ever forgive that man. Ever. Needless to say, there was a battle that ensued, not for 10 minutes. Not for 30 minutes, not for an hour, not for two, not for three, all night. All night long, they canceled with my dad. They prayed with him. He said he would never forgive that man for what he did to his son. All the meanwhile, I'm over there practically leaving this earth. I don't remember anything. So what happens? Thank God for the Holy Spirit. Thank God. It, you know, it reminds me, and when you were preaching this, Pastor, there's a parallel here. Jesus told Peter three times, right? And, and he had to do that with Peter several times, right? Not just that one. He gave two examples. My dad was kind of like Peter, you know, he wouldn't let go. He didn't get it. He didn't, until, hasta que se prendió la luz, when the light turned on in his spirit, that he was sinning, God not forgive him, that he was actually sinning. And that verse was right on what you, what you said of unforgiveness. That was, my dad was living that. And the Holy Spirit got a hold of him. He broke down, literally, face to the ground, shouting, I forgive him, I forgive him. And then he asked God to forgive. Señor, perdóname. He had a true arrepentimiento, a true, um, in English, <laughs> repenting. He truly repented. He saw that he was sinning and that it was going to cost possibly the life of his son. He forgave that man. And then when they got through with all that, this is like in the morning hours. I estimate it must have been close to sunrise. They go into the room to pray for me. Because now there's going to be a miracle. Because my mom told the doctor earlier that the night before, you, doctor, you've done what you can. Now my God, my God is going to do something. You've done all you can do. It's okay. So the faith of this woman and the agreement among our family members that believed with my parents for a miracle. But most importantly, the unforgiveness that my dad had to walk through in forgiveness and that cycle of forgiveness and unforgiveness, the following happened. So I'm in the room over there. All I know Okay, and here's where it gets crazy, amazing, glorious, okay? Because I, I got no other words to say, but it's glorious. I wake up. Bunk, my eyes just open up. Mind you, I had glass. I had cuts in my eyes. To this day, I still go to the same doctor who washed my eyes, Dr. Paul Scott. I still see him every year. Check me out. He calls me the miracle boy. 
because he says my eyes, if you look with the instrumentation they have to look in there, it's like a stained glass, you don't have stained glass, but a stained glass window. He said everything is cuts everywhere, scars. He was able to get all the glass out when I was in ICU. He got all the glass out. But the scars remain, except over my optic nerves. He said, your angels, or your angel, covered, like, you, who watched the Three Stooges? I'm just kind of, anybody watch the Three Stooges? Curly, Mo, Larry. Remember one of the things I did, like, fuck, you know, fuck. Remember that move? <laughs> it's like your angel did that, covered your pupils, the optic nerve, from the glass destroying your, your vision. Otherwise, I'd be blind today. And I only wear glasses now because I, I, I'm on the screen all the day, all day long because of my vision <laughs> and age, right? So my eyes open up, and all I can tell you is there's a, what I thought was the sunrise coming through the window, but it was not the sunrise. You know that color, that warm amber light of the morning or the evening when you see the sunset? That filled my room. There was a sunrise in my room. That's all I can tell you. A warm, bright, not bright, a warm, amazing light filled my room. And all I can tell you is I felt like as if two hands touched my head and fire ran through my body. And instantly, I felt completely normal. I felt like, here's how I felt. I couldn't, you know, I had tubes in me, so I was like, Ugh. what am I doing? What's going on here? And then I look at the TV, and Looney Tunes is on, Bugs Bunny, which I love. Who doesn't like Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck? They were on the TV, and I started watching Looney Tunes. And I felt completely normal, except for I had tubes coming out of my nose. And, and then that's when they walked in. They, they came in after that. Abraham, my dad, my mom, my brother, Pastor Loreto, and Carlos, they come, and they're like, what is going on? And I can't talk because I have tubes, right? So I ask for a piece of paper. Can you see me right with? And I wrote on it. I wish I had that piece of paper. I don't know what happened to it. This morning, Jesus. <laughs> came to my room. And he was completely healed. You can imagine how they reacted with joy and crying and Abraham, Pastor Abraham came up to me and he says, I'll never forget it Pastor George, he looked at me and he says I am loved you, he said it three times he spoke about three times, he says I am loved you I am loved you to this day that fascinates me that he says that, you know, because we think that I am, right so he was prophetically speaking the words of love to me So, so they prayed. They still prayed. They prayed, thanking God for what happened. They didn't have to pray for my healing. I was already healed. But they prayed. The doctors come in. They're like, what's going on? What's going on here? They, they did x-rays because they would do x-rays every six, eight hours. I don't know to check the progress of that syndrome. Guess what? Nothing. It's completely clear. Nothing clear as a whistle, just clean, gone. That was in the morning. By the evening of the same day, I was out of ICU in a regular room. Okay? They kept me for observation. They had to, obviously. They didn't, they, they were freaking out. The doctors didn't know how, what, we know because God did a miracle because my dad forgave that man. I don't even want to think about what would happen if he wouldn't have forgiven that man. That changed not just my life, because that miracle is life-changing. That changed my dad's life, my mom's life, the family of the church, and many lives that have heard this, this testimony, because my dad forgave. So whatever you're going through in your life today, please don't hold stuff in. You've got to forgive. And not just because to get something. 
It's more than that. The blessing of the miracle, the bigger miracle, is that my dad forgave. That's the miracle. I'm the benefactor of his obedience to God's word and to forgive. What happens when you forgive? You said it. If you don't forgive, you're in a, you're in a cage. What are you being caged? What's being caged? All the blessings. Your life is in a cage. All the things that God would have for you that you don't even know. They're too marvelous maybe even for you to understand. None of that will happen if you have bitterness in your heart. Unforgiveness. Seeds of unforgiveness yield terrible things. But when you open that cage and you forgive, God blesses. And that's what happened with my dad. I'm the benefactor. And so I got into the regular room. I was there a few days. I still had, you know, fractures. Get this. I still have fractures. I'm, I'm not a baby Christian, but I'm baby in the ways of these miracle kind of things happening, right? Because we, we grew up in a very traditional church. We, we didn't, you know, they didn't preach about that stuff, you know. And baptism in the Holy Spirit and all that stuff was not touched in the traditional church that I grew up in. And I love that church to this day. My uncles are awesome men of God. And that, tr- that church has changed too. It's come along, a long way. But my point is, this was new to me, okay? I was not used to this kind of stuff. So I go home. I get, get released. You know, I've got cuts and all that stuff. I'm healing. I'm, I'm, I'm coming along. But I'm in a wheelchair. I'm in a wheelchair. I go to, uh, and I'm having this pain, terrible pain in my hip. One day I wake up in the morning and I'm like, I'm tired. I have like uh, um, righteous ind- indignation. I get angry at, at Satan. And in the name of Jesus, I will, in the name of Jesus. And I felt a pop in my hip. Pop. That day I had an appointment. I was supposed to graduate to crutches. They did an x-ray. No fracture. Gone. He goes, you don't need fracture. You don't need crutches. You can't find your fracture. Isn't that just like God? Isn't that just amazing? And it's all because of unforgiveness. And I mean, forgiveness and unforgiveness. Letting that go. So I, I'll wrap it, Pastor. I, I'll wrap my testimony here because I could keep going. I'll read this one scripture and then I'll hand it back to Pastor Jorge. The same Psalms 91. Psalms 91 is special to me because one of our dear friends in our family, Fernando Saavedra Caruso, he came to visit me at the hospital and he gave me this, this, cha- this, um, this chapter. And, um, and it ends with this in verse 14. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. And with long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. So I just want to encourage you. If you want to have those kinds of blessings in your life, in your family, with your husband, with your wife, with your friends, with your relationships, with your, in your career, in your profession, in your, in your everyday life, in everything you do. Don't hold things in your heart with your brothers and your sisters and people you don't know, like in the case of my dad. With anybody. That's why the, the word says be blameless. We, we have to be blameless before God. And we cannot hold of those things and expect all the blessings that God has in our lives. So I stand here today as a as the product of forgiveness. And I stand here with my beautiful wife, one of my daughters, my oldest one couldn't make it. And all the things that we've lived in our lives are so amazing because of my dad forgave us. So I just want to encourage you to take that word dwell on it and let God speak to you whatever you're going through in your life open your heart and surrender it 
God gave everything for us. God the Father, he gave his own son. He gave it all. He put it all out there. All of it. Let, it, let us not be the ones that hold things, little things, when he gave it all. I was going to, I don't know, I don't know if I said this, but I was going to mention this, and I want to mention it. His goodness is chasing you. Everything Pastor George preached about Peter, Jesus is relentless. He wouldn't stop. Why? Because Jesus, he, his goodness chases us. And it's always, and if we're running away from God, he's right there behind us chasing us. He's waiting for us to just turn around. He's, his goodness chases you. His goodness chased me into a hospital room and healed my body. But not just healed my body, changed my life forever. And my parents, my family. That's the goodness of God. So I implore and I, I don't beg, but I beseech thee, as the Apostle Pablo says, uh, Pablo says I beseech thee to heed these words. Receive Jesus as he pursues you. He's chasing you. And when you receive forgiveness and extend forgiveness, it's going to be amazing what God does in your life. Amen.